Alright, I'm, uh, I'm ready to roll. Thanks. Hey, uh, I'll introduce. Sorry, I was trying to get the analytics thing here. Um, I think it's, uh, I think for the last I think, year or so, I've been involved with the NetSquared community in Vancouver, primarily in the Gastown area, and it was really helpful for me. I found as someone involved in charity and trying to see how charity and technology could intersect. So I think um, I recently moved out to Fort Langley and Eli and Chad and I were talking about um, just, you know, what this could look like about, you know, venturing out to the valley and I think Eli was so excited about the idea of franchising and growing and expanding and, and I think there is, you know, as, as you noted, there is a lot of charities based in Abbotsford and a lot of churches and a lot of groups that do charity work out here and so, um, you know, I thought we could service kind of the Langley, Abbotsford, you know, mission region. And so I think with uh, a lot of Chad and Eli's support, we decided to try it and give it a go tonight. And we have a special guest, Chris Gagan, which is pretty awesome. Um, and again, it's a topic that I personally am um, really excited to learn a lot about, being that analytics, I think, drives a lot of how we run our site and what we do on our site. And I think it's a great way to kick off Net Tuesday or uh, Net Squared here in the Abbotsford region. So I'm excited to be here and to see this grow uh, month to month and to continue to see those involved in charity and even small businesses we've seen through um, Net Squared in Vancouver come out and share ideas, share resources, share what's working, best practices. And I think as we share as nonprofits, because we maybe have a more nimble or you know smaller budgets, I think the more we can share and the more we can resource each other, it'll be, it'll be better for the growing community. So I'll invite Eli up to share maybe sure. more about the whole Net Squared vision. And sure. What's the what's the dream of it? Because I think you're the Net Squared guy for uh, weirdly the world. I, the I've world. Heard yeah. it. So so hi, my name's Eli. Um, I've been doing this Net Tuesday Vancouver thing now for three and a half years. I inherited somebody else's project, and I've sort of taken that forward, and I've got. People like Aaron and Chad who have joined me as volunteers to make this thing happen. So it's been my volunteer gig, and, and what is this? It's uh, it's basically a monthly meetup for people in the nonprofit and technology communities, and the goal is to take people from these two different communities and put them in one room, smash them together, see what comes out of that, see you know what learnings can come out of that, what expertise can come out of it, and. Um, and I've been having a lot of fun doing that. Eventually, as Darren kind of said, I got to make that into my halftime job. So for the last eight months, I also support the global network of Net Squared organizers. And there's about 50 active groups across the globe. And uh, so there's about 200 people doing this kind of thing out there in the world. And I get to be their cheerleader, basically. I've got little virtual pom-poms <laughs> and tell them that they're amazing. And it's very rare that I actually get to go to another actual Net Squared event. This is actually the second non-Tuesday, Net Tuesday one I've ever been to. Um, actually, it was just in Seattle, which just relaunched three weeks three ago. Three weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and now I'm here. So in one month, I've got to go from like never having been to anyone else's event to now getting to go to too, so I'm really jazzed about that. Let me just tell you really quickly about what this thing is. So you've never heard of Net Squared. That's fine. Um, you know, if you haven't been to one of these events, it just hasn't happened. Um, but that's useful. So, uh, so what is Net Squared? Net Squared is, as I talked about, this global network of people who want to connect the technology and nonprofit communities together. And and I think what you makes it unique and valuable, and what you touched on is that they're there uh, over and over again. That they actually have their goal of forming and you know, building face-to-face -face community, which means we get to then start building these peer support networks. Now you have someone you can go to and say, like, I've got this problem, who knows the answer? Um, and if you go to a conference, they do this amazing thing, they're gone and they're unreachable. And so what we get to start building is is actual enduring community where we get to you know, learn and grow together. And so we've also got a website which, you know, we've got some other fun things on there, you know, a bit of a community blog, um, some challenges and contests, and then these kinds of events are featured there as well. 
And so Net Squared is a side project of TechSoup. And a lot of you who have worked within charities probably already know TechSoup because they're the software donation arm. So if you want Microsoft Office or you want like, you know, part of the Adobe Creative Suite, all those kinds of interesting pieces of software, you can get that at 90% discount through TechSoup. So, so if you don't know about them and are accidentally paying full price for your copy of Microsoft Word, I encourage you to stop doing that because um, you can get it for much cheaper. And it's like official through Microsoft, it's all good. What else do I have to say? So yeah, so we do these three things. We do content, a blog, community, that's us, and challenges. I'm running one right now, which is sort of a contest for people developing Windows 8 applications only for people in America, so shh, I won't tell you any more about that. <laughs> but as I said, we, uh, we've got a blog. I post there from time to time. I encourage you know my organizers to also take the photos, the videos, the the ephemera of these events, and and collect those as well, because that's sort of how we learn from each other and find out what works. And uh, and as I said, we're scattered across the globe. You know, about 30 groups are in the North American region, but we're in West Africa, across Europe, Australia, Asia, most corners of the world, except apparently for Russia, we've got some kind of presence. And we do these challenges, and I talked about that. There's a fan fancy contest. One day there'll be one for us. Right now there isn't. So, uh, oh, in fact, there's me right there. Um, and, uh, and there's another fun group. So yeah, we get together, we do fun things, organizers. So certainly, if you want to get more deeply involved with what we do here at Net Tuesday, and sorry, at Net Squared events, you'll hear me stumbling. Vancouver is called Net Tuesday. That was a historical name I inherited. Now they're usually Net Squared events, so that way they don't have to only do their events on Tuesdays, which drives me crazy when I try and do events on the weekend. Um, so, but ways you can get involved is, one, obviously, you know, you can yell at us on Facebook and Twitter, or use the, like that little hashtag, pound net two. You can always, you know, get involved through one of our contests, and one of the things upcoming is we'll actually be doing a digital storytelling challenge. So we'll be asking people to be creating one minute videos, or sets of five photos where they basically tell the missions and the impact of what they do within their day-to-day -day organizations. And we'll be providing some webinars and workshops to say like, hey, here's some skill sets and you know, we'll give you prizes if you're awesome and all that good stuff. But honestly, uh, this is the heart of it, like, you know, where you actually get to have this face-to-face -face experience. And uh, I encourage you to tell your friends and neighbors. And uh, if you're ever in Vancouver, you can come visit our Net Tuesday. And we are starting to expand out. So uh, we've got a group emerging in Victoria in the next couple months. Nice. We, have, as soon as the election's done, he's deep in election mode, uh, yeah. poor kid. And, uh, and we've got a group who is probably going to come together out of the Surrey Library. And if your community <coughs> feels like it might need something like this, talk to me. That's all I got for you today. Um, do you have any other kinds of questions about what it is? Tell me, yes. I, I just, I'm curious why it's just nonprofit that you focus on. Like what, what, is, what was the original? Totally, so that's a great question. So the reason nonprofits are the original focus from head office is because their primary role in this world is to service nonprofits through this software donation program. So that's, that's the most important thing for them. But these Net Squared events, because they're run by volunteers at the local level, all have very different flavors. So mine, like, like others here, will invite people from, from other sectors, be that social entrepreneurs, be that small business. We all, at the end of the day, have very core needs, which are very similar. Yeah, our last event had a whole bunch of really techie programmer sort of guys, right? So, I mean, depending on the event, you get different audiences, right? Okay. Yeah. But we tend to find that they are united by by sense of social purpose. Right. Um, 
and that doesn't have to, of course, live within the nonprofit legal structure. But that's usually what we say, like, what unites us, what makes us different from the social media club, from, you know, the small business groups, is, is we always say, like, the case studies we bring, the stories we tell, are trying to be connected to people who have got social purpose. Okay. Other questions while you've got me? So are you saying that um, TechSoup got NetSquared going? Yeah. And, and um, then NetSquared has, has a life of its own, or it's, it's related to all the TechSoup groups? It is still related in that they, they cover my time 20 hours a week, and that they pay for the subscription to meetup.com. But the local organizers are highly independent. Um, and and can basically create whatever they want, which is part of the local orientation of, of, of NetSquare, which is to say, if we're gonna serve local needs, those needs are gonna be very different in every community. So are there NetSquare groups uh, forming or folks like yourself all across the country? Or? So um, within Canada, it's actually been fairly quiet until recently. So there's a Toronto group, there is a Peterborough group just starting up right now, and a Montreal group who hopefully is going to get something going by March, but they seem a little stalled right now. Uh, but no, Canada's not the hotbed of it. The hotbed of it really has traditionally been actually the East Coast, uh, really around Washington, D.C. in there. But uh, well, we're going to change that, because at the moment it looks like Australia is going to take over. Like there's four groups going, like boom, boom, boom. So. Thank you so much. Again, look, we're here, we're all square, and uh, invite your friends. Oh, that's why it's called Net Square, because of the nerd element. We're all square. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, uh, that is more, I, I love that name. I'm just, it's I'm more like a I've never understood the name. Um, <laughs> I think he might have a great name with the Mighty World Square. <laughs> yeah. Big bit of nail on the head that we haven't seen before. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, we're like, no, 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 we're cool. What are you talking about? <laughs> Is it likely to be once a month? So Darren, if you want to speak to that. Yeah, I know we have one coming up in two months. And then I think we'll see how the momentum goes. And then ideally, we could do it once a month. That'd be great. And continue to grow from here and mm -hmm. get more people out. That'd be awesome. But I might suggest there's a fair bit of work to be running something like this by yourself every month. But should other people say, like, I want to help build this, I think Darren would be open to some people being involved in that. And all kinds of capacities. You could become a photographer. You could be like a community connector doing like outreach and marketing. So many roles. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the first event, right? I think the the major step is to let people know that this exists, right? And for other nonprofits, right? They're in the area. Should I get started? There is, yeah. Sure. All right. Well, so who are you? Uh, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, so the presentation, if it's a little different than the description, I apologize. But uh, I will give a little... Uh, I'll give a little background as to why that's the case, and I'll make sure that we cover all of your questions in the question and answer period at the end, too. So, uh, a bit about who I am. Uh, I'm a product manager uh, at a company called Peer Giving Solutions. We build uh, software for charities, and uh, so as my role there, I'm deciding sort of what the features are that goes into the product. So I'm, I'm using analytics of some sort of every day to sort of see how our product's doing, see what changes we need to make to the product, that sort of thing. Um, I'm in that capacity too. I'm also uh, advising uh, fundraising types. Um, we have a consultant. Uh, we have a consultancy in our in our same office, and they advise charities on how to use the web for fundraising. And a lot of times they'll come to me for, well, how do I measure this, or how do I do this thing in Google Analytics, or whatever, just metrics, whatever program that it is that they're trying to track stuff in. So I'm often answering these questions, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about it. And so that's sort of why I'm excited to be here tonight to, to talk to you guys. Um, here's a bit of my contact information if you are interested. I'll show that again at the end um, in case you need it. Um, so we kind of got a chance to talk about 
who you all are. Um, and it's nice that it's intimate like this. I like this size group um, because we get to ask lots of questions. And so uh, one of the things I would say is, you know, if you have any questions, if something I'm saying is not clear, feel free to interrupt me just at any time. Um, one thing that would be interesting to maybe quickly go around the group and, and answer this question, how are you using analytics or metrics now in your organization or um, at the website that you've been involved in? Um, you want to start us off, Darian? How you've been? For sure. Um, we've had Google Analytics on our site for about a year and a half now, and I feel like I go in and I check like the referral sites, like who's been referring people to us. Uh, the most popular content, um, and maybe once in a while I check like which countries they come from, and that's it. There's like three things I do when I'm in there. Yeah. And then just you know, I think about a few months ago I started realizing Kissmetrics was helpful, and I see a lot of numbers. But the main thing all I see is like we set Kissmetrics to see how much is donated every day in our site, and then I just look at that number, and then the rest I'm kind of like it's foggy to me. Mm. So that's all I really pay attention to. And then if it's a good day, I send it to the board and like, hey, we had a five thousand dollar day yesterday. Yay! But I don't really understand the rest of the numbers. How about yourself? Sure. So currently, I mostly use analytics for for tracking whether the links I send out into the world actually generate right. clicks and activity. Yeah. So, so what I mostly do is I go into the I Google URL builder yeah. and uh, Google has this nice little form where you put your URL and then three parameters and it spits out a URL with question marks and gibberish. Nice. And, uh, and I use that um, to then, I put that into Bitly, I encode it, send it to people and when they click it, then I know exactly <clears throat> whose links were actually clicked on. So that's what I mostly do around analytics these days. And that, and that tool was called, for everybody else, what was it called again? Uh, it Google. probably has an official name, but if you Google URL builder, yeah. it's always the top link. I definitely recommend doing that, and if you're not sending out all your links, like any link you email out to somebody, you put on a card or you do anything, if it's not being generated by, by that, you're missing out on a lot of potential information, so I highly recommend Now this can out. also, I find, be extremely depressing. Like, never send a bit.ly link to your friends and family, mm -hmm. because then you know exactly how many people actually like paid attention to your email and clicked on the link you sent them, and you don't really want to know the answer to that. <laughs> um, it's much better to sometimes be ignorant of people's engagement with what you do. With, with that URL builder link, do you have to like go to a special website every time or can you install a little fancy widget so you can click that to copy it or is it always like this extra copy this go yeah. to the website paste it in copy this go to where i want pay, you know is there yeah if you are if you're just using plain old email or you're just doing a facebook post or twitter you, you kind of have to do it that way if you're using um MailChimp for a newsletter, it will do it automatically for you. Yeah, Hootsuite, Hootsuite I think. will do similar kinds of things for you. It, it's certainly, yeah, a way to systemize that. And there are um, spreadsheet templates, so if you're going to build out a campaign, yeah. like here's my 15 links and all my sources, you can just drop it into a spreadsheet and it'll if, spit yeah. that out. If you bookmark it, it'll take you 60 seconds and it's well worth the 60 seconds because it, you'll figure out how useful that email was that you sent out or that yeah. whatever. Yeah. Well, sometimes, it, it, maybe it's, this, I didn't realize this, but we spend like twelve ninety nine on GoDaddy and we'll buy a domain name. Like we recently put an ad in a magazine mm -hmm. and bought like Love Global um, uh, Converge.com because we put it in this Converge magazine and we're gonna see through, I think we'll be able to tell through analytics how many people actually typed in that exact domain name, right. mm -hmm. um, which we hope can track whether it was worth it or not, but yeah. but it's twelve ninety nine every time. So totally. But you're describing the trick where it's easy to track online links, but sometimes it's very hard to say. Print. Did yeah, did print, did offline things. How do you track that? And that can be harder without hacks like Darian's kind of talking about, where you create a brand new URL which forwards to the same place as always, yeah. but you know every time it forwards through, you're like oh. Okay, then that comes from that ad because that was the only place in the world with this particular version of it. And you'll, if you see like bus billboards, you'll often see that. Even though it's like this advertising Coke, it'll have like 
some clever campaign name like like coconutbus.com and that's basically just for them to know yeah. did that campaign do something for them and sorry I don't want to take over but before that I worked at the Suzuki Foundation for five years and there what I really use Google Analytics for because it was a high traffic site was measuring conversion funnels which is I kept on sending people to donation forms to newsletter sign up forms and when you're sending thousands of people to a page, anytime you can optimize that conversion point to make sure like, oh, 10% more people actually got to the submit button and actually finished this form, completed this action alert, that could result in a thousand more people for me at the end of the month, which was one of my goals. Mm. I just use Google Analytics to make sure that all the links are working well. Yeah and the standard stuff on websites. Don't use it at all with Facebook or anything else. Yeah. Um, Google, through Google Site Builder initially. Yeah. I've used, uh, I use Google Analytics. Um, don't understand all of it. And I've tried everything, like there's, what is it, 44, 45 or something like that? There's like different, I sort of Googled like, you know, different measuring tools and, right. and, and I've tried several. Um, I find that they all give you different conflicting information. Mm -hmm. right. um, I use websites that are CMS platforms, so like I, I'm using Weebly right now. I don't know code, so I, I'm looking for ways to measure properly anything that happens with my site and, and, and then the blog is on WordPress, so you know, things that are being shared. And there's so much more that I need to learn about using all of these in a way that that I can actually measure you know other than using the the um, information that WordPress gives me or Weebly gives me because mm -hmm. okay. it conflicts with Google like right. Google gives me yeah right. so and and with this interview I really <coughs> want to be able to measure like how it's being shared so I'm going to try that Earl link builder yes. see how that works Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. If we have some time afterwards, maybe we could fire something up on the screen out. and yeah, yeah, we sure. could walk through some of that process. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned Weebly. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, Weebly and Jimdo are. I, I look for anything that's free because it's just me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have anyone, you know, donating money to, or giving me money to set things up. So Weebly, uh, Weebly dot com. It's um, it's basically a click uh, and drag and drop. Mm -hmm website builder and it's it's actually got a pretty good reputation it's easier than wordpress wordpress is great if you want to run a blog weebly you can run a blog on it as well but i find it's better just for a website i am actually using the blog right now just to update news like so if i find one or two things i might i don't actually write long blogs or anything like that and i use wordpress for that because it's a little bit more it's not as finicky, it's easier to manage, the blog part of it, but Weebly, as far as a website, it's great. I, I find it's, and it's free. <laughs> it's just my number one criteria. <laughs> uh, so I use Google Analytics to track and see uh, how many visits we have, especially when we're running <coughs> a campaign. Um, November is, one, is our month when we do big campaigns, so just to see if we had any impact. I also, um, use it to see where people are coming from because we break down um, BC into like five different regions so just to see who's using our website mm. because it's has a big resource section um, just so we can kind of target some of our promotion a little more um, we're really trying to reach the north region so just following and seeing if they're actually coming to our site for a resource or mm. if it's just people in the lower mainland Great. So um, <clears throat> I found out that no one at our work actually looked at Google Analytics, like ever, um, until just recently. So I looked at that myself just the other day, and I was quite surprised that people are coming. Typically, the stories that are most viewed are um, businesses hiring people, not so much stories about the people. So it seems to be like where you know businesses that we have partnerships with those seem to get like way more traffic, and then you know the success story about you know Bobby gets very little traffic so but I you know I, I was in there for about an hour and I did a lot of clicking 
a little bit of understanding, but I <laughs> feel very new in the category for sure. This is a new field for me. So, okay. so I'll, this is the outline of where we're going tonight um, in four parts. Uh, the first part we're going to talk about vanity metrics, what those are, why they're so bad, why we want to just ignore them and not waste our time on them, um, because they can be a major time sink. Um, you can get lost in analytics and you can spend hours and hours on it and have nothing, nothing to show for it at the end. Uh, so why do we want to stay away from vanity metrics? Um, what are uh, actionable metrics? So if we, don't, if we want to avoid vanity metrics and what those are, what do we want to uh, be tracking, and, and we call these actionable metrics. Actually, this is a this is a phrase coined by Eric Ries, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then uh, I want to talk, take that, uh, and talk about testing frameworks. So how we can actually test ideas. So um, analytics, to me, are only or analytics or metrics or whatever it is. This data is only interesting to me as so far as I can make a decision based on it. If you know, if I'm just looking at data for data's sake, it's, that might be fun, but it's not useful. So uh, what, I, what I feel is really important for uh, organizations to understand is how does this affect decisions that we make, and how can we use analytics to make better decisions about uh, the stuff we're doing? And then finally, we'll wrap that up with the topic I call people, then metrics. So people first, and then metrics. Uh, what we're really interested in tracking isn't metrics or data or any of that stuff. We're interested in what I believe we in, should be interested in and we, we are interested in is this idea that people behave in a certain way. Uh, decisions and changes I can, uh, I, I can affect and that'll change the way that uh, people behave. And I want to know how my decisions or how my changes affect the way people behave such that I can move towards a more positive behavior. Uh, you know, if I'm a charity, there's various things I want to, behaviors I want to impact and change, which, you know, one of the behaviors, obviously, is I want people to donate or become a monthly donator, don donor. <laughs> and, uh, or I want to, I want somebody to share it on social media. These are sort of behaviors that are positive, that I want to encourage, and what are the things that I can change to encourage those things. Um, so, Initially, the topic, I can't remember exactly how you wrote the title, Darian, but it was like Google Analytics and Kiss Metrics, and I kind of felt like maybe that's going to mislead people into thinking that we're going to like dive down deep into how to, like a how-to seminar on how to do that. Uh, and I think that's useful on one level. However, there's a ton of resources out there on how to do that. So my last slide is a bunch of resources that if we don't get time for that, you, you can I'll share this presentation with you. You can follow those links, and it'll kind of unpack the how-to of what we're talking about today. But I don't want to dive into the how-to without there being more of an understanding of of why why are we doing it in the first place. Um, so I like this quote: "There are three kinds of lies: lies, damned lies, and statistics." Or <laughs> I crossed it out in metrics. <laughs> to me, it's kind of the same thing, um, and. The point I think this makes is that we can we can make metrics or statistics or analytics mean pretty much whatever we want, and uh, that's sort of the heart of vanity metrics is that we can um, we can come to the data with preconceptions or an idea or maybe a decision we've already made in our mind, and then warp the data or even just put a little spin on the data to m make it mean something. Um, that maybe it doesn't mean. Um, one of the, my favorite Twitter accounts to follow is Stats Canada. Has, has anybody followed Stats Canada? No. Yeah. I started following them when, when one of <laughs> I saw this tweet come up on my um, feed and it said something like, one third of all Canadians make up 33% of Canada. And then I started following them. This has got some good ones here. Uh, 95% of Ontario residents are using family data to get away from their families. <laughs> um, so two points I want to make on this slide. One, using statistics makes, or metrics or numbers or data, makes whatever you're saying seem more plausible, seem more solid, and it's a good communication strategy. But clearly, we know that they can be used for evil too. 
Um, I match this anywhere else. <laughs> the, the, the other point I want to make about this is this is often what vanity metrics look like. There's some sort of line that start down in the bottom and they go over they go up over time, like site visits, for example. That's the common one. It looks just like that, you know, over time. But that's that's the case with any website. The longer it's out there, the more traffic you're going to get. Um, it doesn't really tell you much. That just tells you your website's getting traffic. It doesn't help you make decisions, really. Um, and so that's sort of an indication of it, the vanity metric. If it's just something that sort of slowly goes up over time, it doesn't help you make any decisions. So we have a, a page you're probably familiar with if you've opened up Google Analytics. This is usually one of the first pages you see, or at least a section of it. And, and the funny thing about this is there isn't a single piece of information. This is the first page you see, so you'd expect it to be useful. But there isn't a single piece of information on this page that helps you make good decisions, right? Um, you've got that, that line, right, <laughs> that goes up over time. Um, it makes you feel good. Though. It makes you feel good, right? <laughs> and that's an indication of a vanity metric. Is it, is it when it goes up, it makes you feel good. When it goes down, you are able to sort of um, uh, make it due to some other outside force. Like, it's not something you did, it's something somebody else did. Whereas when it goes up, it's something you did. Obviously, your marketing campaign worked. Um, so, I mean, visits and page views and bounce rates and percent of new visitors, I mean, those are interesting things to look at, and I did the first time I opened up Google Analytics, I spent hours looking through this information, I probably did that for the next three months, um, and I didn't have much to show for it, um, because there isn't, they don't really tell you anything, mm -hmm. I guess is the point I'm trying to make, so don't be that guy, don't be the guy who's uh, <laughs> obsessed with vanity metrics. <laughs> Uh, and so let me stop there for a second um, and just talk a little bit more about what those are and some of the signs of a, a vanity metric. Um, you know, hits, visits, page, pages per visit, um, time on site, these really broad categories aren't, aren't that useful. We'll see in some ways that they can be useful, but only in certain contexts and we'll sort of we might have time to, to see what those contexts are. Um, are you, is there sort of an understanding there of what a vanity metric is and maybe what I'm getting at and maybe you can identify some of the time you spent on? So at? I think maybe the difference between those is a vanity metric, if it goes up or down or whatever, does not mean you're any more or less accomplishing your mission of your organization. You're not actually getting the work done in and of itself. If you go back deeper, perhaps they are indicators pointing yes. you towards that you're actually getting the job done, but none of those by itself say, like, is that getting the job done? Yeah, so if you send out an email blast and you get tons of site visits, uh, that could obviously that could be related to the marketing campaign and that could tell you something. It's not that these these vanity metrics are completely useless, it's just on that surface level there's That's nothing to them. Totally, and <clears throat> most of us do not run organizations whose goal is to have more people visiting our webpage. That is not actually why we exist in this world. Right, exactly. Unless you're like an ad supported ad supported website and you make your rev revenue by having more traffic, more traffic equals more advertisements. I mean that's sort of why Google Analytics is framed that way because that's how that's how they emerged onto the scene as mm -hmm. as a tool primarily for content publishers who are primarily making their money through Google Ads, which is why Google bought Google Analytics from Urchin. I don't think the only interesting thing with that graph those graphs that you showed us was the returning visitors right. because like the new visitor it's just like someone could have come clicked oh yeah that's interesting and left and that's it there's no conversion or anything right yeah. so would you say returning visitors is valuable in any way in this context probably not because it doesn't help me make a decision and, and to be honest this number is probably there's probably like for your type of website this number is probably fairly common whatever whatever that is um, I mean maybe there is it, just at this level here, it's it doesn't tell you much. Returning versus um, new visitors, as we'll see in a later slide, is useful. 
but we have to measure it in the right way and and, and it'll get a little bit more into how we do that in, in a way that's more helpful. So, so they're dangerous because uh, of a couple of reasons. One, they can't be trusted. So when when you are having a conversation with somebody and you're using this vanity metric, you're not going to call it that, but you're using this to support your argument, uh, it's very easy for the person to say, well, no, because that doesn't really mean that. It could mean any number of things. And then, you're, and then all of a sudden the conversation just goes to, uh, it falls back on a couple of things. Either it falls back on intuition, which is fine, but you have to realize that you're just using intuition and not data and analytics to make your decision. Uh, or it falls back to whoever the highest paid person in the room is, you know, what, what's their opinion. Uh, or in a moment of crisis, you can know whether data, the data you're tracking is useful or not if you go to the data versus going towards mm -hmm. intuition. And usually when people are using vanity metrics, they go towards <coughs> intuition rather than the data because they know it can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. So it's dangerous because we can get into situations where um, as somebody who's an advocate for some sort of thing, whether it's trying to prove that social media um, is helping our organization or this latest e-newsletter blast was better than the other one, um, we, can, we can get into a dangerous situation there. It's also dangerous for an organization because they might be making decisions based on faulty information. So what do we do? This is where actionable metrics come in, not an idea I created. This guy called Eric Rees, he wrote a book called The Lean Startup. I don't know if you've heard of Lean Startup. Um, it's this idea that um, small organizations, uh, startup organizations or startup products can have to utilize their time um, in the best way possible with the least amount of funds in order to get the best return. And there's all these ideas that sort of are behind this and I won't go into those, but they're very applicable to um, charities, I think, because in a lot of ways, charities have to act like a startup. We have limited access to funding. We have limited access to um, all sorts of resources. So we have to make sure that we're spending our time um, as best we can. So actionable metrics, three A's. Um, one, they're actionable. Two, they're accessible. And three, they're auditable. auditable. Um, this will be, this can act like a litmus test for am I tracking the right thing? So you've got your metric, you run it through these three tests, and if it doesn't pass the test, then you need to sort of spend some time refining what that metric is. Um, the other thing we want to do is we don't want to track every metric under the sun. There's going to be three to five metrics. Sometimes organizations can even get it down to one most important metric and they pay attention to that. Um, we're going to learn in this presentation how we choose the five most important metrics, uh, three to five most important metrics for your organization. Spend your energies making sure that you're tracking those as effectively as possible and forget the rest until you're good at that. Um, so let's talk about what the first day is. Actionable. So if, if the metric isn't helping you make a decision, then why are you tracking it? That's sort of the question you have to ask yourself. Um, and if it's not asking the most important question, if it's not answering the most important questions in your, in your organization or your website or uh, the particular you know, domain that you're involved in, then um, why are you spending your time on it? So the exercise here is to be thinking about what are the most important questions that I want answered. So don't go to Google Analytics or whatever tool it is you're using and say, this is what the data shows me. Instead, try and think about what are the questions I want answered? What are the things that keep me up at night? And then whatever tools you have to use, whether it's Google Analytics or something else, make sure you can track the, that thing. Some of those things you want me to track might not even be online, which would be interesting. So, you know, for a, for a charity or for any sort of organization, these are the sorts of questions, some of the key questions you might want to ask yourself. You know, first and foremost, um, you know, as a charity or a business or anything, uh, you know, we are concerned with the revenue or money coming in usually. Um, 
not all organizations have that as their main goal. So, you know, some, it's just awareness. So you need to substitute that goal out. Um, and so you want to figure out, you know, how, the question is how do we gain or lose customers and, and what metric best represents that? Um, or how do we gain or lose supporters? And, the, and then you have to ask, your, you know, that, uh, that begs a deeper question, which, you know, how do we define a supporter? How do we define a customer? And so that's actually a really good conversation to have if you haven't had, had that conversation. And how do we track on our website, like what, what metric or what event occurs uh, that indicates somebody has become a supporter? Is it when they leave a donation? Is it when they sign up? For an email? Is it when they sign up for a reoccurring donation? Like your each organization is going to have a different idea of what a supporter means for them. Um, you know, if it's a if if you're more of a if you're if you're more of a blog uh, or a sort of a publishing organization, you have to think about what does it mean to be a a reader or a subscriber. Do they need to subscribe to your RSS feed or email? Do they need to what, what does that look like? Um, so th that's the sort of idea there. And, and the hint here is track the macro, not the micro. So pay attention to the elephant in the room. Pay attention to the biggest thing you can possibly track or the most important thing you can possibly track. Um, when we start getting down into the micro, um, it's, it's kind of like going somewhere where we're, we're just not mature enough to go yet. We have to get tr good at tracking the big stuff. So, you know, the revenue, the cust the number of new or new or lost customers or subscribers, um, you know, the, uh, so, some other things we'll get into. So we want to pay attention to the big stuff. Um, metrics also need to be accessible. So, uh, are they, are the latest metrics or the latest data available to the people who are making decisions on a, on a, on a day to day basis? Um, and just to say that they are in, they appear on, in Google Analytics at somewhere deep in the recesses is probably not good enough. Um, you know, if you can convince decision makers to log into Google Analytics and view a dashboard, that's great. If you can create email alerts that get sent weekly from Google Analytics, that's probably even better. Um, or if you have to do it manually, um, th then maybe you need to do that. But they need to be somewhere that people actually will check and actually see. And, uh, and I think Dar Darian has a good example of now he's receiving these daily emails and, and the interesting ones he's forwarding on to his board. Um, I think that's a great way of uh, sort of making it accessible. Um, and then is it easy for people to understand what that metric actually is and what it means and how they can affect it? So the last, the third A, metrics are auditable. Um, think scientific method here. So. It's great if you can track something and show that it happened, you did A and it happened once. Um, you did A and X happened once. Yeah. But if you can't repeat that, then it didn't really tell you anything. So you have to be able to repeat the outcomes of whatever this metric is showing you. They have to be something that can be verified as accurate. So if you're not in those conversations where somebody says, well, that metric doesn't really mean that, it could mean this or this or this. Stop there for a second and just ask if there's uh, questions or if there's sort of understanding about what a actionable metric, the characteristics of an actionable me metric. Is it is it also called like a cookie crumb that you create within analytics? Like you can say like, show me every time someone lands on this page and makes a donation. Like is that? Yeah, so I'll get into how we actually set this up in a second in, in, in Google Analytics. Um, one more characteristic, this isn't a uh, part of his three A's, but I think it's really important. And that's uh, metrics are people too, and that um, metrics that matter are ones that track people, that track people's behavior. Um, if you're just looking, so one of the reasons that, that Google Analytics overview page isn't very useful is it, it tracks 100% of all your visitors to your site and then spews out a number. 
that's not really that's not really tell that's not really tracking people. That's just that's just massive amounts of data thrown into one number. Um, tracking people means breaking, uh, you know, at the very finest level, being able to track what each individual is doing, um, and that's not possible in every so software like Google Google Anal Analytics. It's not possible to do that. Um, I'll talk about some where it is, um, but. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Well, what about the page views and the bounce rate and all that? I mean, doesn't that track behavior? Yeah, so that, that tracks behavior, and, and, that's, and that's a good question. I'll come back to that in just a second if, if I can. Um, a, couple slide, a couple slides in, and I'll talk about how page views relate to what we're talking about. Um, so are you tracking the behavior of smaller logical groups of people? So. In Google Analytics, there's this really powerful tool, and, and I'll, when we get to the sort of hands-on part, I'll show you how, how we do that, but it's called segments, and if, if, if you've been involved in marketing at all, uh, you probably have heard this term of segmenting your, your audience, and there's different ways that you can segment and, and talk about that again later, but are you, are you breaking it down into smaller groups of people, or are you just looking at the big site-wide number? Um, that's sort of another litmus test for is it an uh, actual metric. So throughout this presentation there's going to be a couple slides that start with exercise and what I was hoping to do here was not to do the exercise right now but provide you with something that's really tangible that you could take away and you could do um, within by either on your own or within your organization with a few people. So. Taking all that information that I just talked about, here's some steps that you could take. Determine the three to five most important macro metrics for your organization. Okay? They're going to be different for every person, but they are, or for every organization, but they're going to pass all of those tests that we just talked about. <coughs> so go back and test them against the previous slides. Then map those metrics to events that can be tracked. Okay? So this is where page views. Um, might come into play. So depending on what your um, your metrics are, let's say donating is one, so somebody completing a donation form. What we want to track there is what is the URL of the of the page where we know they've completed or they they completed their donation. So that that specific page view of that URL is super important because we know. <coughs> It's kind of like a proxy for them completing that event. The actual event that we're tracking is a donation. The way we do that is by looking at whether or not they viewed a specific page. And that thank you for donating page is the one we want to look at. So it's really easy to track metrics where you have a specific page. It's really easy. So we want to take a metric, tie it to an event. And that event is represented on our site either by a button click or a form being filled out and submitted or a page being viewed. Those are sort of the three common ways to, to track events. I'll go over that again. A form being submitted, uh, a button being clicked, or a page being viewed. Mm -hmm. Usually you can tie the event to one of those three things. What if, uh, let's say your donation thing was like on a third party thing, let's say like a crowdfunding platform or Canada Helps, could you track where it came from on your site? Yeah. So I think every article on our site has a, you like this, you should donate sort of thing at the bottom. Right, so ideally what you could do with those tools, and I know you can do it with PayPal, I'm not sure for some of those others, is, but oftentimes they'll, if you're sending them off your site, at the end of that donation process, you'll be able to send them back to your site. A lot of times people just send them to their homepage because you've got that page there already and it's super easy to do. Best thing to do is create a thank you page and send the traffic coming from, you know, PayPal is the one I, uh, I'm most familiar with, but p perhaps, no, hopefully, never. Canada Helps could do that same thing. Um, send them back to a thank you page, which you could then you track. You can individualize the thank you pages yeah. to sort that out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, wouldn't you say the referral, like where that person came from and found your site, where they found the form, is more important than because, like, you can you can find out how many people have donated by your budget, right? So, so how can you take that even a step further and and track? Am perfect. I getting too far ahead? No, that's that's perfect. I mean, that sort of answers your own question 
uh, when we were talking about, uh, or I, yeah, like some of those other things that we see on the page um, and user segment. So this answers this slide here, metrics that matter track people, so groups of people. So a group of people could be the, the source they came from, came from before they visited your website. So that's the sort of group of people that could take any number of actions. Donating might be one of them. Um, so we want to track, figure out what are the sort of groups of people that are interesting to us or segments of people that are interesting to us. One of them, if you do a lot of marketing, might be what marketing source did they come from. So you'd be tracking your newsletters, you'd be tracking your paid advertising, you'd be tracking various sites that are linking to you. Google Analytics for, does that really well. Um, URL site builder, site, sorry, the, the URL builder is another way that we would be able to group people in. The custom domains that you might put on a print brochure is another way we'd be able to group. So now that you've, you're tracking all that, you've got people into logical groups. And yes, we definitely want to see how those logical groups of people um, fair when it comes to the key metrics. Right now, we're just at the point where we're trying to figure out what are the key metrics and not necessarily how we test them. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So the key thing, the first step to this is figure out what your metrics are that you need to track and then start tracking them in whatever tool it is that you're using. Um, so a couple tools here that I'll make mention of three throughout the presentation. Google Analytics, it's extremely likely that your top five metrics are going to, are not going to appear in Google Analytics by default. So um, it's, it's very likely that you're going to have to go and create goals for every single one of your, um, every single one of your metrics. Uh, goals can be pages you landed on. Um, that's the key goal that Google Analytics sort of provides. If you want to get more complicated than that, the bad news is, and you're using Google Analytics and you want to keep using Google Analytics, the bad news is you have to go with events. And events are something you're going to need a developer for. So it gets a little, it gets a little complicated. So hopefully, and this is where I would start, is start with the goals that can be tracked by URL. If they land on this page, they've done this event or they've completed this goal. Does that make sense? Now, two other tools that I think are worth pointing out, and they're very similar. I don't think I have a preference between either. I'm using Kissmetrics right now, um, and I, I can highly recommend that one. Um, they, they are alternatives to Google Analytics, and we'll get into some of the pros and cons. But their whole focus is around tracking events or metrics like we've been talking about so far. So it doesn't track all of the stuff that Google Analytics does, but it really focuses in. And these tools allow you to do things without as much developer input. So you can track form submitting, form submitting and buttons being clicked and page URLs without any developer involvement. All you have to be able to do is copy the code they provide you, just like Google Analytics, into your WordPress site or whatever it, whatever it is. So with very limited, you know, you can borrow your, your younger nephew who knows how to do this sort of stuff and get him to help you copy and paste that into your website. And then from there, you can, um, you can do most of the setting up of metrics without any involvement from a developer, which is great. Unfortunately, I can't say that for Google Analytics. Now, Kiss Metrics and Mixed Panel cost money. Uh, Google Analytics is totally free. So you just have to weigh the pros and cons. We use Google Analytics and Kiss Met We use Google Analytics for all our sites anyways, just because it's there and free, and it might one day track something that Kiss Metrics wasn't tracking. So we might as well do that. So we're going to get into how we test those metrics against specific groups of people in a second, but I just want to make sure there's an understanding of like what a, what a good metric is, how you might come up with what those are for your specific organization. See some heads nodding, nobody has any questions. Okay. So now we get into some of the, the more interesting part of this, I think, um, which is how we use these metrics that we've decided are important to us 
to now make decisions. So three sort of gold standards in this arena, funnels, cohorts, and A-B testing, okay? So funnels might be the most familiar, I, I would guess, of these. And, and the way a funnel looks is like this, <laughs> with a bunch of people at the top, slowly as you go down the level, smaller and smaller groups of people because they're making it through the process. Fewer people are making it through the process. You know, people are, the easiest is, let's say you have a multi-page, multi-step donation form. You got three steps to fill out the donation. So you get 100% of people who get to that first donation page, 50% make it to the next. And then of those people who make it to the second page, only 30% actually complete the donation. I'm just making up these numbers, yeah. right? So that would be your your funnel for your for your donation. There, in your experience, is that normal to see a, that much of a drop off, or what's? Oh well, the, yeah. Oh, I guess that's why they call a funnel instead of a rain spout, right? So. Yeah, I just made those numbers totally up. I mean, probably the numbers are more drastic than that. I bet you lose way more people on the first page of a donation form. Okay. And and I'll I'll come back to the donation form because I think it's a good example. So a funnel is a series of events that represent some sort of progression towards a goal. So like we talked about those metrics and those key events uh, that we want to track, usually the last step in this process is one of those, right? So donation, the last step, that's one of our key metrics we wanted to track earlier. Goal, it, the goal here would probably be that metric, that, that donation. And then the series of steps is, um, either the pages in the donation form or some sort of logical progression that you that's suitable for your organization. It identifies how many people move from one step to the next. Usually you require, oftentimes you require um, people to go through the steps, like their gates, um, but you don't have to. Google Analytics allows you to, 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 to let people enter the funnel at any point in time, if that makes more sense. Um, so there's two kinds of funnels. There's macro funnels, which represent, which usually can be called a, a user life cycle, and they represent the the life cycle of a user on your website over a long period of over the lifetime of their using your website. Now, I would say that this is the most important funnel you need to be tracking. So, uh, and, and I'll get into, I'll come back to that one because it is the most important. The one we're more familiar with is probably the, the micro example. And this is the, a donation form or any sort of wizard where there's like step one, step two, step three. Um, these are useful because we're guiding the user through a process and we can see where they fall off the process. Um, Darian and I, a while back, we started this, uh, this company that has since then failed. Um, and, uh, we, and we had created a website to sort of track interest. And the way I set up the website was you came to the front page and you got some general information. If you're interested, you could click the button See Schedules. Then that took you to the next page. And on See Schedules, you could see See Pricing. And then after See Pricing, you could Buy Now. And so what I did was the whole website was basically this funnel. And I could see, and I, and I was tracking this Google Analytics, and I could see where people would fall off the funnel and what this allowed me to do was to see, oh, they were turned off by the pricing, or they were turned off by the schedules, and I could make, we can make tweaks to the pricing, we can make tweaks to the schedules, and we could see if that helped more people sort of push through. Yeah, go ahead. How would you know if, because I've also read that it can take a little while to build trust when people purchase products. It's like anything, right? We buy from websites that we trust. So a lot of your visitors, your first time visitors, are not necessarily going to buy. For sure. So yes. what can you say about that? Uh, that, that is an amazing question. I, I, I didn't pay you any money for that. Can you just, no. It's just right? stuff I've read. <laughs> like there's so, so much information out that, there. I mean that leads exactly into, into this next step. Okay, so. Q slide, eh? <laughs> can you can you all say R? Okay. So A A R R R. This is sort of the this is the acronym for um, uh, one model of a user life cycle, which is sort of what you're talking about. The user life cycle represents multiple visits over many days and weeks and months, 
right? So if you're in an online store and you're selling something and you know one day they come and view it and the next day they come back and they add it to their cart and the next day after that they buy it, you're not just interested in what they did on the single day as if they were a different person each time. You want to want to get a sense of what they were doing that whole time. That's true for any organization. So here's what that acronym stands for. Acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, referral. Again, this is over many days. It's not the example I gave before was was still a useful useful funnel because it allowed us to get some instant sort of uh, feedback on whether this was a good or a bad idea. But this helps us know whether we're like majorly on the right track over the long term. How, how do you track somebody returning over and over? How do you know who it is? And it's right. Registered. It's not a computer. So one of the things about Google Analytics is that it tracks, it, it anonymizes the results. And the results you get aren't actually perfect. It, you have to pay you have to pay their big expensive bill to get perfect results. So it, it uses its, its com these complex algorithms that I, I can't explain to give you a rough idea about numbers and it anonymizes all that data. So you can't track a person from day to day uh, with Google Analytics, can unfortunately. You, can you do that with KISS? KISS metrics, mixed panel, that's what they're built for. So. Um, if you're wanting to get into this, I definitely recommend checking those out. Again, they cost a little bit of money, um, but if you're going to use analytics to make some big decisions, it's probably worth it. So, just just quick question, that so how does it track users from day to day? Is it like a kind of IP sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, it, it tracks it with a. Persistent cookie, I think is what it's called. Oh, I can't okay. really explain the technology. So it leaves it all and uses computers, you know, that computers come back and visit you. Yeah. Totally. But if you open up another browser. Or look at it on one of these new human. New human. Well, and then it ties it to your email address. So if you have accounts on your site or if they submit an email address when they are donating or anything, if at any point they give you, you get their email address, you track that and all of a sudden, all of those accounts that previously were separate now become connected. But I don't want to get too much into that. There is a way to do this in Google Analytics, but it's not perfect. Okay, so you can look, you can create this sort of funnel, but you can't see that, you know, that this this little line here represents a person. You can't see that that person is this person here or this person here. It's just big bolt of information. The one way to make this a little more useful is to start using um, uh, advanced segments. I've got some more information on that at the end. Um, to, to create logical groups. And that'll give you a rough approximation of how those people are going through. So one idea would be to have this funnel and then view the funnel for different marketing sources. So people who came from different marketing sources, how do they sort of go through that funnel? And now, yeah, so it, it won't be perfect, but you'll have a rough approximation, and, and I'll show a little bit more about that. Just a question around sure. non-profit pricing or donations, that type of thing. I find them in typical pricing, if they don't give me the price up front, I find that kind of annoying, if I have yeah. to dig through it. And I assume that if I have to dig through, it's going to be really expensive. Kiss metrics. Kiss metrics for a business is, I think, it's ninety dollars a month. Oh, well, not so much in kiss metrics. Oh, okay. But just in, in the donation approach generally. Oh, uh, some sites you go to, you don't really get a sense of what kind of a donation they're looking for. Right. They make you work through a series of steps, and you've talked about that funneling. Yeah. Um, I find that kind of annoying. Right. Yeah. Is, is there a sense of whether others are the same, or does it work? Or? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, does it work to have the, we're asking for $100 right up front, rather than sneak you through a, a funnel before you get to that? Yeah, the, hmm. the, the one thing that I do know is that once you get to that donation form, there is a, there's, a thing, there's a strategy called anchoring, and that is, don't just give a blank text field that they can enter any amount they wanted. 
give it some context. Right. So you, you've often probably seen this where it's like $500, $250, $100, $50, $50 or five, 10, mm-hmm. or 10, five, one dollar. I mean, the, you see either those number number sets and you're gonna type in totally different things into the, into the donation field. Um, that's the only study that I really know of. I don't know of one where, where there's been a study of like whether you put the dollar value on the homepage, the expected donation on the homepage versus uh, on the donation form deep within the site. You see that a lot on public television right. ads. Yeah. If you found that, I mean, we'll get back to this. You could test that. You could test for that for your could, specific yeah. organization. And I'll, and I'll come back to that. Hmm. I'm going to keep going through because I think I might be running out of time here. Um, so we'll try and get through this part really quick. How do acquisition? How do people find you? What are your what are your marketing sources? This is we've talked about this a couple times already. You know, Google URL builder, um, Mailchimp campaigns, having URLs that can be trackable. Where you know, where are people coming from? That's that's the main thing you want to be tracking there for for that first part of the funnel. Um, and this acquisition can be can be visits, you know, site visits, unique visits. So not pay, page views or p- that, but how many unique people are coming to your site? Uh, or referrals, I guess. To who refers it? Yeah. So that would track as a unique visitor, regardless of how they came to the site. Is yeah. Um, activation. Do people have a good first experience? So what event is going to happen? Uh, in order for you to feel like they had a first, a good first experience. For some people that might be um, leaving a donation, leaving a donation. Some people that might be signing up for an email. Some people, uh, it might be sharing it on social media, or some people, like it might be, they viewed three or four different pages. That's not a great one, but it, in lieu of something more useful, m- might be okay. Um, Another way you could track do they have a good first experience is actually ask them. You know, there's these things that you've probably seen on sites where you pop up a little survey and say, you know, did you find what you were looking for today? Um, do people come back? So this is where we're looking at re- unique versus returning visitors. And I said before, just looking at that unique versus re- new versus returning visitors wasn't that useful. Where it is useful is when you start looking at which small groups of people return or don't return. So if you send out a market, if you have a, an e-blast and you drive a bunch of traffic to your site only to find out that n- they click the link and then never come back, um, that might tell you something like you had the wrong, you were emailing people the wrong thing or the message was misleading. Like, why didn't you connect with those people? So that's more helpful than just looking site-wide at that number. Here's some examples of what uh, what these things might be in the different stages. So acquisition, visit a site, doesn't abandon, so they view two or more pages, stays for 10 plus seconds, two plus clicks. These are vanity, vanity metrics on their own, but combined with small groups of identifiable people, they are more interesting. Um, happy first visit, you know, views X pages, stays on site for so long, subscribes to the email through, subscribes to your email through, um, sorry, your email newsletter or your RSS or whatever that is. Uh, or maybe they sign up for an account if your site has that sort of thing. These are things you might call activation. Um, retention, um, you know, how many, you can track this sort of stuff in your, your, your newsletter program, how many times they, they click it once they've, subs- they've subscribed. Um, how you, your your new versus returning visitors that sort of thing. Um, referral here is how many people are actually sharing it sharing your site uh, either via social media or by email, and and different people are going to describe that different ways. Um, what what's better to describe here is referral is to actually track the number of shares going out, but not just like that create visitors, but create people who do that either, that maybe activate, they get to some sort of level. Like it's, it's not as helpful to track how many people just share and 500 people came through that link. Well, of those 500 p- people, how many of them actually like activated and became 
a donor or whatever it is. And then revenue um, down here, you know, uh, you might want to think about what the cost of getting that person to your site was and what sort of break even revenue would be. Right, so some people like Syrian, I don't know if you know how much it on average it costs you to rec recruit a new um, donor or supporter to your organization. But if you could figure out what that number is, Amazing. then you might be able to uh, then you'd be able to track, you know, at what point have they donated enough to to um, validate your campaign, validate the campaign yeah. that, that, that you've broken even. And I'm gonna be honest, a lot of this stuff it's gonna be very challenging to do in Google Analytics. Not impossible because if you had a developer who would work with you, Kiss Metrics, Mixed Panel, a whole lot easier to do all this sort of stuff. Uh, I sound like I'm trying to sell it. Can you, sorry, can you still do all that stuff with websites like Weebly or WordPress, you know, where yes. they're like, you know, you're not using code? Yeah, the, the, pretty much all of them provide a place to copy and paste the little bit of JavaScript that Google Analytics, Kiss Metrics, or Mixed Panel need in order to operate. Once you've done that, that's the most technical thing you need to do in order to set them up. Okay. Um, so we talked about groups of people, technical term for them, uh, a, group of a group of people, we call them cohorts. This is a term we borrow from the medical field. Uh, when they're doing medical trials, each of the different groups that are testing the drug is a cohort. A uh, cohort uh, definition is, some, is a group of people that have a common characteristic or experience, have been exposed to some sort of similar condition, and then we track that behavior um, and compare it to other cohorts. So one cohort would be uh, a group of people who receive a newsletter and click the link versus received a different newsletter and click that link. Um, if you're using MailChimp or something like it, it allows you to test different headlines in your, in your newsletter. So this is an example of A-B testing, which is just an, which is a sort of subset of cohort cohorts. So cohort A receives one newsletter, cohort B receives another. Then you can go back to, go back to your funnel or some of these analytic, these in, analytics that you, metrics that you've been tracking. And you can see how did, cohort A or newsletter A perform on these things and how did newsletter B perform on these things? This is super So advanced. again, would you have to send them to separate landing pages then to track where they came from? Um, no, not really because if you're, well, if you're using MailChimp, you don't need to. If you're using lots of newsletter software, we'll do it automatically. But if you're just using, let's just say you're doing a straight up on email or you wanted to compare email to Facebook. You have two very similar posts. The only difference is the link in one has been generated by the URL builder and the link in the other also generated by the URL builder, but they track differently. Then you don't... So that's where you would do it. You could basically make the same URL twice, have two different unique URLs that have been built. Point to the same place, right. basically. Okay. Um, and then you could then Google Analytics and Kissmetrics tracks that stuff automatically and you'll see it and you can see what we yeah so what we get hung up on too is like button clicks and these micro events that happen but what we should really be paying attention to is did it did the end result happen because I can make anybody click a button I can create an email that's super awesome and people want to click the button but it doesn't tell me that people actually had the behavior that I wanted to because we're not concerned with button clicks, we're concerned with the behavior behind the button click. That's important, right? Um, or the behavior that's three steps after that button click. So outputs and not inputs. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, so examples of cohorts before and after tests. So you make a change to your website. One sort of really simple way to do cohorts is to have the data from before that change and have the data from after that change. Um, time periods, marketing sources, product versions, priming, I won't go into all that because we're running behind. Uh, A-B testing. A-B testing is a way of, there's 
when you have cohorts, one of the simplest ways of doing A-B testing is saying group A experiences one thing, group B experiences a slightly different thing or a totally different thing, and how do the two behave after that. Um, this is sort of the gold standard for decision making with web metrics. Um, bulk, so you need to, and, and here's the thing, is you need to be very careful about what you A-B test. I'm going to talk really quickly about what you need to do in order to figure out what to A-B test. Um, but in order for this test to be of any use to you, you have to get 100 conversions, mm. approximately. That's the sort of ballpark. Now, you can calculate this. I will put a link in here so you can actually calculate what that true number is. But if it's, you know, on average, it's about 100 conversions. So if you're testing donations, then you have to realize you have to realize that you have to have a test large enough that's going to result in 100 donations. So you have to be really choosy about how you do it, and, and it has to be large scale just for that whole, just because of that. Um, you know, if you're Google, then it's really easy to do A/B testing. I mean, on their own products because. 100 conversions is no problem at all in a day. For most of us, 100 conversions might take three months. So you want to make sure you're tracking the right Yes, thing. don't do what I do, which is don't test your donation form in July when no one's going there, because <laughs> you don't get anything. Yeah, or time it with a time it with an e-blast, or get creative and pay for advertising so that you can drive a bunch of traffic. Spend $100 in Google Analytics so you can get more conversions and answer your question. You know that's sort of a that's sort of a hack way to do it. Um, so cohorts, funnels, A/B testing. How can we do this with the tools? Google Analytics funnels are a bit limiting because you can only track URL views. So the way the funnel works is they view this URL, then this URL, then this URL. Um, that can be a bit limiting once you start digging into this to figure out what you want to actually track. Um, they do provide A-B testing, um, and they have a great tool for it. It's called Content Experiments. They've got lots of documentation on how that works. I recommend checking it out so you can, you can start that pretty easily. Again, it's a matter of copying and pasting some JavaScript. So as long as you can do that, you can use a lot of these tools. Um, and then advanced segments help us break things down into cohorts. Um, Kiss metrics and mixed panel, a lot easier to do this sort of thing to sort of optimize for it. Uh, what do I test? How do I know what to test? Answer, talk to people. Okay, so the number one way, don't just like create an A-B test for it because you think you need to. Um, figure out what it, what the big change is that you can test and then do that. So don't just try, well, what happens if I have a green donate button and an orange donate button? Like I said before, if you have to have 100 conversions to tell you whether the orange versus the green is going to be 2% better, I mean, that's not going to, it's going to be helpful and you're probably wasting your time on that. There's two ways. So. Quant qualitative, qualitative, then quantitative. Usability tests, interviews, you don't have to be an expert, just talk to people, ask them questions, watch them use the website, watch them use the software, whatever it is, and make notes. Once you've interviewed about five people, decide what what is the key, what is the theme I'm getting here, what's the key problem, come up with a hypothesis that that will say, if I make this big change, or if I make this small change, it's gonna have a big impact. Okay, so the change can be big or small, but the, the key thing is it's gonna have a big impact, and, and or has the potential to have a big impact. And if, and if this change doesn't have a big, that way, that way you're not talking about like micro differences, like 2% differences in conversion rates, which you probably have like a 10% error range, you know? So choose something that's gonna be like, the answer is going to be completely obvious that you're going down the right path or the wrong path. Make it as big as you can, um, because when you're small, um, there's no point in worrying about these micro things. So, kind of rushed to that last part. 
here's an exercise. Talk to people, do usability tests or interviews or whatever it is. You know, this can be this can be anybody. Uh, you probably want it to be as close to your target customer or segment or supporter as possible, but if you can't get access to those people, just sort of grade on a scale, uh, as they say. Um, develop a hypothesis based on this. Identify the relevant macro actionable metrics. Go back through the acid tests of what an actual metric is and make sure you're tracking the right thing. Design an experiment using cohorts and funnels and then start tracking this. And now you're probably really frustrated because I haven't shown you how to do any of this. Literally like walk you through it. Um, and like I said, I think probably the best use of time was to sort of give you the high level so that you can kind of know where to go next. These links here, and this somehow will get shared with you, I think we can probably email it out to people. Yeah. Uh, following each of these links will give you a step-by-step -step on how to do the things in the different tools. Okay. Um, so you've got uh, Google Analytics, there's a bunch on there, set, how to set up goals, which is how we track our metrics. Setting up funnels and cohorts, which is how we test and make decisions based on those metrics. And, and A-B testing, which they call content, uh, I forget. Experiments. Content experiments, yes. Um, KISS metrics and mix panel, their documentation covers this stuff very concisely on their website, so I haven't provided any other links for that. And then usability testing, a link to it if you're interested in that. There's a book there that I would recommend reading. Download on your Kindle and start reading it right away. Uh, Huffington Post uh, has uh, had a good article about uh, interview, interviewing supporters or customers and that sort of thing. So, there's my contact information again. If you have any questions, I'm sure you will. Don't hesitate to uh, hit me up. So that bottom link there is all the slides. <laughs> yes. So you can copy that down. That'll link to SlideShare. You can down. You can download these slides. Mm -hmm. And see how there I've used Bitly. I can track you now. See uh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So you were actually paying attention. All right. All right. I'm there's getting like on. a Google link. Shortener? Yes. Is that the link builder you're talking about? Is it, that the same thing? No, it's it's uh because that tracks it's, as well. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll just wait on. for people to finish copying down and we can pull up. Yeah, slightly different way. I we can show you the differences. Okay. Yeah, it's very it's like Bitly. Yeah. But and so I, I think the two can be married together beautifully. Okay. Any questions before we get into maybe some of the finer details about the high level? stuff I just was talking about very quickly, yeah. very, very quickly. So the hard part to me has always been when I go into a organization that is more than one person to actually get some form of agreement on what is actually important. That what are the macro conversions that we think are valuable um, and ideally move away from raising awareness because I'll barf. Mm -hmm. um, not my favorite thing because it isn't measurable in a way that mm -hmm. is useful to me. But do you have any tips on on navigating those conversations to to actually get from people what is truly important to them to get those those macro conversion points? Because it can often get lost in the the day to day activity in their organization. Yeah. The place I start is what are the, what are the top three? I, and I guess you could have. It relates back to whether there's a clear vision and strategy for the organization. Uh -huh. and it's hard to it's hard to fake that. So one key test is if I if you ask an organization what are the top three problems we solve for our audience, yeah. would they be able to answer that? And if you can, I don't know I don't know of a good <laughs> shortcut for that. I know of I know of one way to represent it, which um, I enjoy called um, the business so one good way to frame this decision the, those sorts of conversations is around 
a one-page document that represents your entire business model. Okay, so uh, this website here, um, let's see if I can find a better screenshot. No, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Uh, I mean, it's really useful for just sort of breaking it down, breaking down the conversation into something that's a bit more ta tangible. So uh, you've got here a bunch of areas you need to figure figure out uh, with with the organization. And if and if you haven't done this, or if you haven't figured figured some of these things out, getting to key metrics might be a little uh, premature. Yeah. Um, so I find this to be a helpful model to have those conversations. And the way it sort of works is you work from the outside in. So on either side. So you're trying to get to that USP that are yeah. the value proposition. Well, yeah. I think it's like, who's your customer segment, problems, UVP, and then some of these other, once you've got those three main columns, some of these other areas are easier to fill out. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, I think you're right. There's just not a shortcut for for hard things. Yeah. Oh, if I could add something too, I've read a lot about copywriting, <laughs> and it, I mean, it doesn't relate to form building or anything like that, or metrics, other than copywriting is really important to converting or letting getting someone to actually read through an email blast or something like that so copyblogger.com is a great mm. I don't know if you guys have heard of them but mm. they're really really respected online and they uh, like there's a, a whole sort host of information why is copywriting important well, when you what, you don't mean like copyright little, like 2009. Don't steal this copyright, do you? No, no, not copyright as in and as in uh, rights like to something, but copy as in you know like journalists use copywriting to to draw your interest into a story. So it's your content, exactly your content. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where that journalist jargon came from, but it's a weird word. Like, yeah. Like it's written copy. I don't know if you mean yeah. copyright in this sense too, where it's like headline. Uh, yes, that's exactly what head, it is. Headlines matter, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Because copywriting is about um, isn't about selling directly in terms of you know. Uh, yeah, this is exactly what it is. It, yeah. Yeah. Does your does your copy match the ad or the email that you sent out? Um, do does it does your copy drive them to an action, or does it you know does it suggest something like does it create trust? Does it create all of those things are important? Yeah, because you're creating a story around your your campaign, right? right? Uh -huh. So are you conveying that message in a way that people are interested? Are you drawing people in? Mm -hmm. But telling a story is a hard thing to do, mm -hmm. right? So landing pages. I mean, if you're interested in trying this stuff, but it's kind of scary to do it. Um, for your whole website, one way to get into it, uh, an easier way to get into it, is through landing pages. And if you're doing any sort of marketing, landing pages are extremely helpful. Uh, and the reason it's sort of easier is you can just you just have one page. You usually have one goal, and you can sort of get good at tracking on a very simple level. What a landing page, the way you might go about creating a landing page is you have an email campaign or any sort of marketing campaign and rather than them sending them to your website you send them to a specific landing page that's designed just for that campaign great uh, website for doing that another great tool for doing this um, unbounce.com you don't have to know anything about creating web pages Vancouver based and there's a nice form here for give it to me for free yeah, a lot. I think Kiss Metrics is uh, free for charities. I think uh, Unbounce. It, okay, yeah, you just found that out. Um, so try that out if you're sort of interested in the concepts I was talking about, but it seems too complicated to do for a whole entire website. You can try this. Try some of these things with a with the landing page for your next marketing campaign. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I'm 
Yeah. So that one is leancanvas.com. Yeah. Is it leancanvas.com? Is it Google? Yeah, I think it was leancanvas.com. Now, I don't pay for the service. I've I've just uh, found an image of it and then created like a using PowerPoint created it myself. You can pay. I think there's a free plan too, but you can pay for this and includes other features. But the main idea here is this concept. Um, there's a there's a book out there if you're interested in reading books. Um, <laughs> Weird. So yeah, there's this book called Business Model Generation. It's similar to Lean Canvas. It's, Lean Canvas is based on it, and it goes through this whole idea of like how you might do this with an organization. It's the interesting thing. They did it the other way around. A lot of them went out, like, the, or go to the book. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that's what's likely to happen. Yeah. This has been very informative. It certainly stretched my view on all of this stuff. And you made it quite understandable um, and uh, very practical. Okay. And I love yeah, the framework at the beginning and like the vanity metrics part, which I have not seen in other events that have brought Internet Tuesday around analytics. So uh, we'll talk this July. Okay. Unless you're on holidays. Who knows? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I, I'm definitely interested in any feedback you have. This is the first time I've done this presentation, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot. So I don't. You probably could tell there at the end that I'm trying to cram a lot yeah. into it. So I'd love feedback on what was good, what was bad, what you'd what you'd spend more time on, what you'd spend less time on. Yeah. That's that would be awesome. It did not seem like a, a first time you've done this. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No. Well, I've been thinking about it a lot, so I've been able to, uh, to wing it in that sense, but um, first presentation on it. Yeah. You mentioned one thing very briefly. You talked about ads. Somebody might buy ads, yeah. Google ads or something. To, um, is that an entirely new presentation? <laughs> because it's yeah. like a fairly large topic. Probably, it? and not one that I currently know a lot about. It's something that I'm starting to test. Like, mm -hmm. AdWords is a whole nother that's what you're talking about is yeah, a whole it's nother deeper than this isn't it yeah. Yeah. there's whole strategies in how you bid i think darian probably knows more about it than i do yeah, yeah it's actually interesting for a um, topic in the future well i could just give you just a quick cheat we could call it um google allows charities to apply for um, a grant which um is ten thousand dollars a month of google adwords credit mm -hmm. um which allows you to bid on ads for a uh, dollar um, up to a dollar an ad, so it could look like 10,000 visitors, but the problem that most even large and small charities have is that they don't have someone that can generate the ads and create the ads and maintain it. So actually a company out of Toronto is called Connect Ad, so just Connect Ad. Uh, for $100 a month, they will manage and maintain your Google AdWords grant money for you, and they'll give you a monthly report about the success and um, what ads are popular, and they'll go in, in throughout the month and tweak them and change them and make sure that you're getting the most bang for your donated buck. Uh, and you can also pay them to do the application for you and do the whole process, but the application is pretty simple, but I think it's just that whole management is where the tricky part lies. And Chris has been in touch with them and ensure that we, we got good, we, they were managing it, but we didn't have it synced with our KISS metrics. Mm -hmm. But I think now that it is synced, it helps monitor yeah. If you're going to pay for advertising, you want to be tracking. I mean, any marketing you do, tracking, tracking, tracking. Mm -hmm. I mean, one one mentality to to approach is track absolutely everything you can, but only pay attention to the most important stuff. The reason you want to track everything you can is because one day it might be the most important stuff, but for now. You know, so you have to have be of two minds in that in that sort of sense. It's okay to track everything, but be focused on what you're paying attention to. Hmm. For example, this here I brought that up um, because I think it could be tempting to like try and figure out what your whole funnel is and how to track the whole thing, um, and that might be good to do theoretically. 
uh, or like on a theoretical level, but to actually start implementing it, I would focus probably, this is the first time, first time doing anything like this, on these two, mm -hmm. activation and retention. Um, because if people aren't having a good first experience and they're not coming back, you got a big problem. Yeah. Revenue and referral can wait till you figure out this problem. How do you find people? That can wait too because there's no sense in driving a ton of traffic to your site. I mean, except for if you're doing an experiment, that could be, that's I think a different strategy, but in terms of like legitimately trying to do a ton of acquisition, it doesn't make sense if you don't have that right. Because you're gonna send a ton of people there and then they're gonna have a bad first experience, potentially. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Ooh, this is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being my guinea pigs as well. What? Tell you that. Sarah, awesome. do we have to be out of here soon? Like, do we have time to dawdle? What's yeah, going on? Yeah, we can definitely dawdle.